and welcome everyone to another Women's Health Tech Wednesday. Oh, we're getting really excited with it. <laughs> My name is Dina Joshi, and today we will be bringing on our guest, Lisa White, who is the Director of Value-Based Transformation at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. And as you know, we love questions here at Women's Health Tech Wednesday, so please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and I will make sure we get to it towards the end so that Lisa can answer your questions. And so with that, we'd like to formally bring on our guest, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for the invitation to talk about my two favorite things in the world, so I'm excited <laughs> to be here. Absolutely. Well, maybe we just jump into it. Um, would love if you can just share a little bit more about yourself and your journey that led you into the healthcare space. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I think I always wanted to be in healthcare, although for years I insisted I was going to go to law school. So, you know, <laughs> dodge that bullet, luckily. <laughs> um, but I started out uh, actually as a benefits administrator for a large corporation. And it was the very first time that I had experienced mm -hmm. what it was like to have to navigate the insurance system and the healthcare system. Um, you know, I was, I was really lucky. I had two uh, parents with professions where we always had insurance and we always had healthcare and it was not a thing that we had to really think about. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until that experience that I suddenly went, wow, this is a whole different thing for uh, other people. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I actually got really excited about being in healthcare and, and trying to bring my, um, bring my work into a space where I felt like I could make a difference for somebody somewhere. Um, and that's just sort of kind of led me along the trajectory. I ended up getting a pre-med degree with zero interest in becoming a clinician, but wanting to have that baseline knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, working through long-term care and pharmacy and consulting work and all sorts of things that have actually led me to my current role at Horizon. Wow. It's taken a lot of, so it was a winding journey, but you were able to kind of see all the healthcare spots along the way. That's yeah, a, and, it, and it helps me because it, it makes it really easy for me to sort of connect all those dots. So I know how this might flow over to this and might have a downstream effect to that. So, uh, so it's been really helpful. That sounds incredible. And what do you do in your current role at Horizon as a value-based director? Yeah, so I am responsible for um, all the innovation, all of the contracting, and all the management of the primary care value-based program. So that's across commercial, Medicaid, and Medicare Advantage lines of business. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a pretty pretty big footprint, um, but it's really fun to have both the operational piece. And the mm -hmm. innovation and strategy piece, because we get to take, you know, our crazy, what I call our shower ideas. Like when I get on a meeting with my team, shower thoughts. so I was in the shower this morning and they go, oh God, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but it's cool. We get to take our ideas and see, you know, do they have legs? What can we do with them? How can we integrate them into the program? So, uh, so it's a lot of fun. That sounds incredible. Just the, the ability to kind of merge the creative, you know, problem solving, big picture thinking with some of the more operational kind of cogs in the wheel type of thinking as well. It sounds like you're kind of able to get the best of both worlds. It is. Yeah, that's incredible. And, you know, of course, when we think about the work that you're doing and when we hear the word innovation, um, we often think of technology. So would love to kind of learn from you, you know, what role does technology play in value based care? And what are some of the pain points that you're seeing that you think technology can solve? Yep. So tech, so first of all, um, I always want to preface this by saying we don't have a shared understanding in the industry of what technology really is supposed to mean, what digital transformation is really supposed to mean. Yeah. You know, I had partners when I was working in Georgia that digital transformation for them was just coming off of paper charts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was, you know, yep. getting something on the computer. Um, mm -hmm. But really tech in value-based care for enablement purposes is really intended to knock down all those black boxes mm -hmm. that we've created in the industry. By that, I mean, you have a primary care physician and this patient is attributed to this, has a relationship with this primary care physician. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, unless they were in a health system and sharing an EHR 
with other touch points, they had absolutely no idea where else their patients were going, unless their patients right. come back and tell them, right? Here's where I went, here's the specialist here, is specialist here is what I was treated for. Mm-hmm. And so generally speaking, value-based care, because we are sort of creating um, the primary care physician as being the center of right. the, you know, the hub of the wheel. Mm-hmm giving them the opportunity to see where are my patients going? What are they being treated for? What's effective and what's not effective? What do I need to talk to them about? And so really that's where we focus a lot of our efforts is how can this information help the provider be better at coordinating care, know what's happening with their patient um, and really, and ultimately because of that, be successful in a value-based program. Absolutely. I love that. I think that's a really, you know, important aspect of it, the transparency of information and just really being able to have everything together so that you can be more holistic in your approach when it comes to treating your patients. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's funny. We all grab onto that ED utilization thing, everybody. That's like a universal pain point. They go to the ED for PCP treatable stuff, but there Mm -hmm. are even simpler, more basic examples. Like if you are a you know, if you are a healthy female of childbearing age and you're pregnant, yeah. you're not going to see your PCP for probably a year because you're going to be okay. seeing your OB. You don't okay. have any reason to see your PCP. And okay. so in the meantime, your PCP has no idea what's happening with you. They are, you know, they don't know what's happening with your care. And so, you know, it's things like that. Behavioral health is also a huge one. Behavioral health has had a giant wall. Mm-hmm. up between primary care and, and BH. Yeah. And, you know, this is a lot of what technology is helping us with now too, is even having tools where we have one tool where the primary care physician can actually not only coordinate care with the BH provider, but mm-hmm. they can trade notes back and forth within this. Oh, wow. Tool. Yeah. So they know, okay, this is what they're being treated for, or I've just yeah. put them on this medication. Um, so we, we leverage tools in a lot of ways with really the idea being making it the very best scenario for the patient. Cause that's the other thing, you know, the, if the patient doesn't remember, um, and many times if you're talking about a person who's busy, older, whatever, they're not going to remember, oh yeah, my BH provider just put me on this new medication a month ago. I forgot to sell my PCP. Right. Yeah. And it's a very good point. I mean, having relying on the patient to tell you everything, I think is very hard because I mean, I'm just trying to even think back to like, when, when was last time I even saw my doctor? I don't even know what really happened. You get like amnesia from those visits. Yep. Um, and I, I love that, you know, you're really thinking about the lines of communication when it comes to what technology can, can help aid as a tool. Um, you touched on this a little bit earlier, kind of during your, your background, but would love if you could elaborate, you know, you have really touched on so many different aspects of healthcare. How has that helped you gain a deeper understanding into not only the broader ecosystem, but maybe some of the fragments and the pain points within that ecosystem? Yeah, I think one big one. um, So I spent three years in institutional pharmacy. Mm. And um, before that, I had already, you know, coming out of long-term care, one of the things I recognized and called out a lot is transitions of care. I mean, transitions of care is where we kill people. And I don't say that lightly, that really is a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So you might have someone that's going from home to the hospital and it's an emergency situation and a family member basically goes, this is, this is no joke. This is really what happens. Goes to the medicine cabinet and dumps all their medicine bottles into a plastic bag and takes it to the hospital with them. Mm -hmm. And then the hospitalist who has no prior relationship with this patient has never seen them before. Patient goes into the ED. They try to capture all the meds and figure out what they're on, what they're not on. Mm -hmm. Um, They get admitted. The hospitalist sees them. The hospitalist discharges them, has never seen them before, doesn't see them after. And then they might go to a sniff after that. So they go to a skilled nursing facility for rehab or long-term care. Then you've got another break in the system where Mm -hmm. that information is not flowing over to the skilled nursing facility. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually frighteningly common that medications will get missed. Mm -hmm. Um, Med passes get missed more often than not, frankly, um, particularly pain meds. Mm -hmm. So if someone has gone into the hospital for like a joint replacement and then they have to go to long-term rehab, very often, 
um, you know, the, the joke in the industry is discharges always happen at 6 p.m. on Friday. So they, they come out at 6 p.m. on Friday. They've come over to the skilled nursing facility. Everybody's trying to make sense of their orders. In the meantime, nobody gave them their, you know, four o'clock pain pill. And by the time they've gotten to the mm. sniff, they're in excruciating pain. Right. And so it's things like that where I've really kind of had a front row seat yeah. to where all of these lines of communication are really broken. And it's really dangerous for the patient too. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, that just, just that scenario in and of itself, I think just highlights just how fragmented, you know, healthcare really is and how it's just so hard to even be able to communicate with all these different groups that have to completely work in sync. It's like a coordinated dance, but not everyone knows the steps are on time. So that's right. Yep. <laughs> that's right. That, that sounds very, very challenging, but I'm sure that, you know, being able to get those types of experiences has just armed you with a bunch of information um, when it comes to your role right now. Yeah. You know, I think the other thing that we misunderstand in the industry too is remote patient monitoring and wearables, mm. things like that. Yeah. Um, it has so much promise. Right. But we have to also recognize there's 27, 28 million people in the US that don't even have internet. And that's a very many, good point. And yeah. many who don't have smartphones, right? Mm -hmm. So when we, you know, I get, I have so many conversations with tech companies and bright young ideas and all mm -hmm. kinds of fresh things coming to the market. But when it really comes down to it, we have to address things like infrastructure issues. Yeah. You know, somebody has got to work on policy positions to support broadband internet in rural areas. This is not, this is not for luxury. This is not so that they can go on and, you know, have Facebook. Yeah. It's because we can actually manage their healthcare early and often by having those tools available, especially, you know, in the last couple of years, look how much telehealth, telemedicine has mm -hmm. accelerated. Yeah. We have so much opportunity to manage patients before they get sicker and sicker. Right. Um, but it's an infrastructure issue. They Absolutely. don't, they don't have it. They don't have, so I'm the crazy person that comes up with suggestions like, well, can we put something in Dollar General? Because Dollar General actually has more locations than Walmart in rural America. Oh, so why, yeah. can't we put, why can't we put something in Dollar General where they go to Dollar General and they have this and they have that. So. I love that. <laughs> I think that you bring up such a good point though, about you know, really when we think about, you know, these types of solutions, how are we really solving for all, not just that select few? Um, and I think, you know, especially in the past few years with everything that's been going on with the pandemic, I think we've all just gotten that front row seat of, you know, technology is not a luxury and nice to have, it's a lifeline. And we've really seen how, you know, it, it does make a huge difference. I really like that you're kind of calling that out. Mm -hmm. And for providers too, we had a lot of providers that did not have telemedicine capabilities at the oh. beginning of the pandemic, a lot. And so we had to actually, <clears throat> we did, but, but only to a limited amount, um, you know, cause we would prefer they go in through their provider, right. but we had to actually stand up an emergency telemedicine program at horizon to sort of cover that gap. Yeah. in the short term. And we did it in six weeks. So I keep reminding everybody, if you tell me we can't do something quickly, I remind you that we set up a telemedicine program in six weeks. Um, that is but, incredible. But the providers, this was so much lost revenue, not only lost coordination and care for patients, mm -hmm. but the ones that didn't have access to any sort of telemedicine platform early in the pandemic these guys were living on fee for service. They didn't have anything to bill. Mm. So luckily this was kind of a wake up call for them. A lot of them are partnering with other organizations that enable this for them so that they can at least do it with their, with their patients. So right. yeah, I, I hope we don't lose that momentum. If we're going to try to get something positive out of a two year unending pandemic, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, hopefully that, that focus on technology is going to be one of those things. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I definitely think it it was a very unfortunate catalyst, um, kind of what happened, but def a catalyst nonetheless, I think, for really not just the need for technology, but the inequities that, you know, can potentially be solved with, with technology yep. if it's designed the right way. Yep. Design that. being key. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you kind of, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, you know, when you just, I guess, in your role, being able to talk to different um tech companies, startups, et cetera, just in, you know, the position that you have would love if you could just share your insight, you know, as a payer, 
what are some of the things that you look for when evaluating a potential tech vendor? Um, how, what's kind of your decision-making process or your framework when it comes to things like that? I would say my number one litmus test is do they really understand who the end user is going to be and what this looks like to the end user? Mm. Um, because the, the enemy of adoption, right? The enemy of adoption of tech is number of clicks yep. and is it going to the right person? Yep. So, you know, I get pitched a lot and I love talking to tech companies, but oftentimes I find out that they have a really great idea, but they've not taken it all the way to the end of understanding what does this look like for the end user? You know, if I'm envisioning this working in one of my provider practices, mm -hmm. I need to understand that I have multiple different kinds of provider practices. I have big health systems. So I've got a bunch of big health systems in New Jersey that I work with. And I have individual single shingle providers where the physician is, you know, the one spouse and the office manager is the other spouse, right? right. So it's just the two of them running it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times the, the final deciding factor as to whether we're going to kind of continue the conversation is yeah. I need to understand what they know about terminology and about users in the space. Mm. Because many times, like uh, I'll get pitched something that's called a point of care solution, point of care. Point yep. of care is actually, is it physically in the room with the provider and the patient when the provider is seeing the patient? Right. Chances are nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. They've already got four or five tabs open on their screen in the, in the exam room, right? They've got a code and they've got to write notes in the chart and they've got to do all these things. Totally. So having that understanding of who are you really intending to use this? If it's yeah. a big hospital system, is it going to be the vice president of population health who's overseeing the whole hospital system and is trying to look for um, consistent patterns that they want to break or impact? Yeah. Is it the smaller organization that basically says, okay, we need to understand, you know, if we offer orthopedics, why are our patients going to another practice for orthopedics? Right. What's going on with that? And so I think a lot of it comes down to really how does that idea look boots on the ground? I love that. I think that's something that that often does get missed, especially when you really think about the nuances of the healthcare system. And exactly to your point, you know, just when we think about a physician, you know, depending on the practice, depending on the size, that the role of what that is can be so, so different. Yeah. That, yes. That's really interesting. And kind of going on this, this line when it comes to just tech, um, you know, for some of those earlier stage startups or just tech companies that are kind of really interested in, you know, having their solutions in these larger health systems, what are some of the challenges that you kind of see when you, when they're kind of pitching to you? Um, and I think along that point too, how can tech companies kind of get more of that insight so that they can really tailor their product to that specific end user? I think a lot of it has to do with who they bring into the conversation early on. Yeah. I think having an advisor who is someone who has worked in the field for a mm -hmm. long time has that good basis of knowledge of what this looks like in different scenarios and different use cases. Um, I think a lot of the experience that I've had is it will be the developers, designers, idea people and the VC principal that's managing them. Yeah. And not someone else that's a voice in the room to say, okay, but this is what this really looks like. Mm -hmm. This is what it'll look like in a health system. This is what it'll look like in a, in a tiny practice. This is what it will look like to the patient when you're pulling all these things together. Yeah. And so I think that's a lot of where I see the whole is they don't have an advisor who has been in the trenches, so to speak, yep. yeah. and understands kind of, you know, okay, where is this? where are you going to have barriers with this? And there's no shortage of amazing ideas, mm -hmm. which I love. I think it's, you know, I joke with people. I'm like, you understand I've been in healthcare since before HIPAA and the internet. Wow. So I am so, totally dating myself and I'm okay. With <laughs> but, but I get so excited about all these great ideas and I mm -hmm. stay connected with a lot of, um, early stage companies uh, that I talked to, I've been talking to for three or four years. And it's so fun to watch them get to a point where they're really getting traction in the market. Mm -hmm. And by and large, what I see is the difference is either the 
person running the startup has been in the trenches of healthcare, or they have a really great advisor that's working with them that has that experience. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that is, you, I'm glad that you're talking about that. That's so important about just being able to have someone that you can tap to that is that wealth of information and has boots on the ground, actual experience to back that up. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I know that you have, you kind of mentioned a little bit about, you know, wearables and remote monitoring and all of these you know, different types of tools and trends that you're seeing in the marketplace that, um, you know, have a lot of potential, but may or may not work depending on the design. What other trends are you seeing, um, you know, in the marketplace when, as it relates to technology solutions, or what would you like to see? Are there any um, pain points that you would like to be solved? You know, it's funny. Um, I will tell on myself a little bit. So since we've been remote, uh, which we've mm -hmm. actually gone back to office now, but only part time. Yeah, um, I don't have a whiteboard anymore. So I used to my entire <laughs> wall in my office at Horizon is a whiteboard. And yeah. I live for whiteboards and colored markers. So I actually have a collection of those giant 3M sticky pads in my mm -hmm. office. Yeah. <laughs> I'll rip off a page, stick it on the wall and start scribbling stuff because mm -hmm. I find that one of the things that happens is we get a really good trajectory. We get really excited, like this thing with wearable tech. Yeah. I live on my Amazon halo. It tells me so much stuff that I need to know. Mm -hmm. And there's so many opportunities to use it. Totally. But I think that's where, um, that, that's where I get fearful mm -hmm. or I get kind of disappointed is that we get, it only goes so far. I want to be able to manage, you know, when I was in Kentucky, I had one practice in rural Kentucky, Hazard, Kentucky, which if you've ever watched the Dukes of Hazard, that's actually a real place. Um, so I actually didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a real place. My grandmother was born there. Um, I had one practice that had 1700 diabetics wow. attributed to the practice, 1700 in rural Kentucky how in the world do you begin to manage that as a payer? How in the world yeah. do you manage that as a provider? Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually, they had some really great ideas that we were able to bring some tech support to, mm -hmm. but it's things like that where had those 1700 people as a blanket rule had internet, smartphones, all those things, this would have been a pretty easy solution because we could have pushed it out through their provider practice right. who they already had a relationship with and trusted. Mm -hmm. But because there were all those failure points, there's only so much we could do. So, you know, I guess what I would hope is in the long run, we can be smarter about how these things um, can be provided to patients. So if anybody wants to work on my dollar general idea, here's my dollar general idea. There needs to be a, a public Wi-Fi in dollar general that's sponsored by payers. All mm -hmm. the payers out there should sponsor this mm -hmm. that will work off of a patient's wearable. So every time they go into the dollar general, it will download and upload the data. So mm -hmm. any developers out there that want to work on that, <laughs> I'm giving you my idea for free <laughs> because it's so simple. It's such yeah, a that's, simple thing. Absolutely. But it would be such a great investment. And I think it could tell us a lot and give us yeah. a lot of opportunity. You heard it here first. The you dollar general first. idea. But please, dollar general, please don't try to start dollar general health. We just, <laughs> <laughs> we've already got Walmart health. We're good. We, yeah. we, we just we need, need structure. We just need infrastructure support. That's it. Absolutely. Oh, I love that. Um, well, we do have a question from the audience. I want to make sure that we get okay. to, um, so let me just read it off. So Lisa says, how often do you get to co-create those shower creative innovations with patients and healthcare professionals to know that the innovation process app, et cetera, is really best serving the patient and the professionals? Great question. So I don't get to work directly with patients anymore, which is kind of a bummer for me because I like to be close to the patient population. Um, but we actually bring our providers into many of these conversations. So once we have vetted out an idea, um, whether it's a program idea or a tool, oftentimes we will put it in front of our providers and say, shoot holes in this. Mm -hmm. 
because right. until they have shot holes in it, I don't know where my areas of blind spots are. I don't know, you know, we all come with our own bias. So we actually did that. We recently launched a, um, a tech tool that go, that's direct for our providers. So they can sign in directly. They don't even have to go through us. And it's a clinical mm -hmm. informatics tool. And one of the things we did early on in the build. So when I was um, co-leading that build, the first thing we did was put it in front of a group of our very robust and trusted providers and invite them, okay, shoot it up, tell us what's nice. missing. Yeah. And it makes it so much better. Not only does it help with adoption, but it really helps us to understand, oh, whoops, we overlooked that. That was not something top of mind for us because we can't possibly, we're not coming at it from the same angle that the provider is. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of like co-creation um, when it kind of comes to these types of solutions. Yeah. I think that is incredible. Well, I know that we are three minutes out. So would love to kind of ask you, um, this is something that we kind of ask all of our guests, if you have any words of advice for the audience or any career advice that you got that kind of stuck with you that you want to share with us. Um, so <laughs> career advice. I will say this, um, and I'm sure everybody's heard it, don't self-select, don't self-deny, don't take yourself out of the running for stuff. Mm. You know, a lot of times, particularly women, we tend to see something and go, oh man, I'm not, I, I'm not qualified for that. I don't know. Or, you know, we'll have this great idea and feel like, well, nobody's listened to me in the past. Why should I think somebody should listen to me now? Mm. Um, there are so many amazing creators in the healthcare space, both in tech and services yeah. that are female and have been female in the last five, 10 years. I want to make sure we are not shutting ourselves down. And moreover, make sure you go through enough no's before you go, oh, maybe this won't work. One no isn't enough. You need a hundred no's. Yeah. You need a hundred no's Love before that. you go, oh, okay, maybe I need to rethink this. Um, so that would be my number one piece of advice. Don't self-select. Don't, don't knock yourself out of the running before you've even run the race. I love that. I love, I think also too, of just having the multiple no's and not just basing everything off of one no from one person. Yep. I Who may then steal your idea and <laughs> turn it into something else. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Well, thank you so much for just taking the time to chat with us today. I think this was such a productive conversation um, and has really kind of given me insight to, you know, some of the things that, you know, I may be overlooking as it relates to technology and infrastructure. So um, I definitely got a lot out of it. So really wanted to thank right. you for taking the time to chat, Lisa. Uh, definitely need to do a part two because I think there's already so many great questions um, or other things we can chat about as it relates to value-based care. Um, Sounds great. I'm up for it anytime. You know, I told you I would tell you, I would always say yes. So love it. Thank you. Um, and so please be sure to check out next week's session um, with Diamond Nutrition Counseling um, on the 15th. And we also have a um, Breakthrough Alliance. So please be sure to apply to that. The last date is on the 10th. All the information is going to be in the chat. Um, wanted to give a thank you to our sponsors, Goodwin and Witham, and also wanted to thank you, Lisa, um, for an amazing conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Everyone go to LinkedIn, follow Lisa. If you have any other questions, please be sure to, to uh, check her out there as well. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the invitation. Of course. Thanks, everyone. See you next Wednesday.